Good morning, everybody. Settle down. Settle down, you hooligans. Okay. Uh, this mic is a little funky. Uh, so whoever's at the back handling the audio for this, when I'm done, you'll have to turn it off. Um, a couple of quick things real quick. Uh, if you've got cell phones, and I'm assuming some of you probably do, because it is 2014. If you've got cell phones, please turn them to silence, vibrate mode, or just switch them off completely uh, so we don't disturb Pat while he's just laying down one value bomb after another for you guys. So, uh, my name is Chris Ducker. And, well, thank you. I'll get that 20 bucks to you later, I promise. Uh, my, na my name is Chris Ducker. I don't have the pleasure of uh, speaking uh, to you lovely people until tomorrow morning. Um, feel free to come along to the session, plug over. Um, but what I do have the pleasure of doing is introducing my very good friend, Pat Flynn. Yeah. That will, I'm not done yet, wait. <laughs> you guys are awesome. I'll pay you the $20 later as well. Um, so I just want to very quickly, before Pat gets going, I just want to do a very quick show of hands very, very quickly to get a very, very important point across, okay? So, if you've heard of Pat Flynn before NMX, please put your hand up now. Now keep them up, okay? That's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. Eh? <laughs> if a piece of content that Pat has created, be a blog post, podcast, video, whatever, if a piece of content that Pat has created has helped you in the last 12 months in your business and life, please leave your hand up. Or oh, see, some more went up. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, so they, they didn't know him until just now, but in the last year, his content has helped them. Okay, now finally, if you follow Pat on Twitter or Facebook, please leave your hands up. Some more went up as well. Okay, now you can put your hands down. Thank you very much for uh, reaffirming exactly the reason why there is absolutely no one better to talk about building a community of raving fans. <laughs> He's warming up. <laughs> than the one and only, the incomparable Mr. Pat Flynn. I have a song I want to play for you guys. And if you know the group or the band or the artist that sings this song, I would love for you to raise your hand. So here it is. Raise your hand if you know the band. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, we got one right here. What's your name? Matt. Matt, what's up, Matt? Who is the artist who's saying that? Backstreet Boys. The Backstreet Boys, that is right. <laughs> Matt, my wife. Yeah, my wife would love you right now, because my wife is a huge Backstreet Boys fan, or BSB, as you guys like to call them. And, you know, I've always known about her infatuation for this group, but I was never really interested in it, you know? Plus, I was more of an NSYNC fan myself. <laughs> but the other week, April was watching me prepare for this presentation, and she was like, oh, what are you speaking on at NMX this year? And, and I was like, you know, I'm talking about how to turn your casual audience into raving fans. And she's like, oh, that's cool. And typically, in our conversations about business, that's where it would normally end. However, I knew she was a huge fan of the Backstreet Boys, so I asked her a follow-up question. I asked her, um, babe, how, uh, how did you become a fan of the Backstreet Boys anyway? And she looks at me and she goes, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> and I was like, do what? What are you talking about? She's like, are you sure you want me to talk about the Backstreet Boys with you? And I was like, yes, yes, yes. I'm doing research. <laughs> and she said, OK. And little did I know, we would be spending over an hour talking about how she became a Backstreet Boys fan, which, at the end of the night, after the kids were down, culminated into, um, well, uh, let, me just, let me just roll the footage. So my wife tells me there's this box I have to see. And uh, I'm a little scared to see what's inside. Hey, babe. What, what's in the box? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I'm going to use this in my presentation, by the way. <laughs> okay. Programs for concerts. 
Okay. That's usual stuff. What is that? Are these dolls? How many of them do you have? There's five members. You have to have one of each. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to edit that out or something. What? What is that? <laughs> you have a framed picture. Where's my framed picture? It's your face every day. <laughs> okay, this is this is too much. Okay. Um okay, bye. I mean, a framed picture, really? Disgusting. But you know, I love my wife. I am her number one raving fan. And she actually taught me a lot about what it took for her to become a raving fan, because that didn't happen overnight. But Really, what is a raving fan? Why are they important to us? Well, a raving fan is someone who is so dedicated, so loyal to you and your brand that they couldn't imagine life without it. They couldn't or wouldn't think of going elsewhere. These are people online who would read every single piece of content you write, listen to every single podcast episode, watch every single video, buy every single product. They'll upgrade from gold to platinum just because they can. They will talk about you so much, other people are going to get sick of it. They will defend you from trolls like their life depends on it. They will market, to you for, market for you for days for free and they will give you completely honest, mind-blowing feedback for you and your business without you even asking for it. This is the ultimate in brand loyalty. These are the people who, you know, if your brand were to disappear, they wouldn't just be sad. They would be downright devastated. But this is the ultimate form of brand loyalty. How, how do we get raving fans? Where do they come from? How, do they, how are they created? Well, let me tell you. Something really cool up here. I want to show you something. This right here, well, this is a triangle. <laughs> but it also represents your entire user base. Imagine this is everybody who's ever come across your site. And within your user base, there are different levels of affinity or likings to your brand or levels of consumption. And we're going to go through each of these really quick. So down here at the bottom, uh, and we're going to call this your affinity pyramid. So down here at the bottom, you have your casual audience. These are the people who sort of discover you almost unplanned. You know, they weren't necessarily going to you, but they perhaps stumbled upon you and your site through chance or by random or through a search or social media or a link from another site, right? And when you're just starting out, most of your audience is going to come into this level. Most of your audience is going to be made up of casual audience members. And whenever you bring new people into your brand, this is where they come in. As you get them to come up this pyramid into the active audience level. Now, this is where people sort of come across your content premeditatively. They know you exist, they like your stuff, and you, you know, they've given you permission to give them more. And these are the people who are subscribed to your site, whether through RSS or through your email list, perhaps they follow you on Facebook or Twitter. And this is what happens when you come out with a piece of new content, these people make a decision whether or not to read it or not, or to buy it if it's a product. Now, a level up from there, we have your connected community. Now this is where magic starts to happen in your brand because not only are you delivering content to your audience and speaking directly to your audience, they're also speaking back to you. But more importantly, they're also talking to each other. And this is where a culture starts to breed on your site, some identity. This is where you get into the, um, you know, if you're fans of Justin Bieber, you're a believer. If you're a fan of Taylor Swift, you're a Swifty. If you're a fan of Miley Cyrus, you're a smiley, twihard, trekkie. People can identify themselves as somebody who is a part of that community. And of course, now at the top, we talked about raving fans already, and we define that. Now, check this out. Most of your audience is here at the bottom of your pyramid, but most of your activity, your comments, your engagement, your customers, your sharing is up here at the top. 80-20 rule, if you want to focus on 20% of your brand that gives you 80% of the results, you need to start focusing at the top of this pyramid. Too many of us are worried about driving traffic to our website and SEO and guest posting and all this stuff, trying to make the pyramid bigger when really you should be focusing on getting people from the bottom of this pyramid to the top. And guess what happens when you do that? Your pyramid is going to get bigger anyway because the people at the top, they're going to be evangelists. They're going to be the ambassadors that will share your brand for you much better than you could ever do yourself. And the best part about this, the, the part that excites me the most is the higher up you go this pyramid, the less pushy, the less aggressive, the less salesy you have to be in order to make things happen. 
These are the people at the top who trust you, you have a great relationship with them. Too many people try to sell to the bottom part. And yeah, I get it, there's so many people there. And that's why they spend millions of dollars on the best copywriters and the best designers to try and convert those people who are just casual audience members into buyers when really you should be focusing on getting people to the top and then you don't really have to sell at all because people are gonna be begging for more. Now, gravity is at play here. It's not easy to get people from the bottom of this pyramid to the top. It doesn't happen overnight. It's not push button easy, but that's why I'm here. I'm gonna show you guys how to take people step by step. We're gonna go actually step by step, casual to active, then we're gonna go into active to connected community, and then we're gonna go connected community to raving fans. You guys good? Can we talk about this? You excited? All right, awesome. Now the main point about this whole thing to get people from the bottom to the top is this. Raving fans aren't created the moment people discover you. They're created by the moments you create for them over time. And it takes a while for people to have enough moments to become a raving fan. Now before we even get into this pyramid, there's three prerequisites, three mandatory things that your site, your brand, your business has to do before we can even start talking about getting people up this pyramid. And those three things are first, providing a great first impression. You can have the best content in the world, but if your first impression doesn't share with the brand new visitor that that's exactly where they should be, well then they're gone. So don't even worry about getting people up the pyramid. They're not even gonna be in it. The second part is making sure you have unique content because if people can get that content elsewhere. Mic crapping out. Check, check. If people can get that same content elsewhere, then you know they're not gonna become a raving fan. They're gonna be a raving fan of somebody else. And lastly, you have to be consistent. Consistency is the fuel that drives this. You know, when you start to get into connected community raving fan level, that's where people start to have expectations. And when you stop producing content, that's all of a sudden where people drop, off, drop down to the bottom and then out. So we're gonna go step by step. Like I said, we're gonna start with the bottom, connected community to active audience. When, uh, when my wife April was 15, she apparently gone through this really bad breakup with her boyfriend, right? So you know, she was confused, she was emotional, she was angry, <laughs> sad, frustrated. Just like a normal teenage girl, right? But, you know, on a higher level because of what was going on. And she had heard a song on the radio that she had heard before, but she never really paid attention to it. But she paid attention to it this time because the lyrics just happened to be saying everything that was going in her head at that time. And this song was by the Backstreet Boys. And this song was, quit playing games with my heart, <laughs> right? You know, I should have known from the start, quit playing games with my heart, right, that one. Now I can have my own framed picture, right? <laughs> but it was at that precise moment that she converted from a casual listener to an active listener because the next time the song came on the radio, she turned the volume up. She knew that song. It connected with her before. When the album came out, I think it was the Millennium album, she asked her mom to buy it and she bought it. And then she started pressing play over and over and over again on her Sony Discman. <laughs> sort of dating her a little bit <laughs> by saying that. But again, it was all because she felt like they were speaking directly to her and everything she was going through. And there's a great quote by Jay Abraham. He said, if you can describe the problems of your target customer better than they can, if you can define the problem better than your target customer, then they will assume that you have the solution. They will automatically assume that you have the solution. So the trick is to really understand all about your target market. Who are they? What are their problems, pains, issues? And speak to them as if you know what they're going. The trick is really, you wanna get your audience, and I don't mean get them like, I'm gonna get you, right? I mean get you like, you want people to say, wow, this guy totally gets me, or she totally gets me. You want people to leave comments that say things like, I felt like you wrote this post just for me. That's the ultimate sort of comment, right? When you can connect on that level. But again, this goes along with understanding who your target market is. Now let's go to the Backstreet Boys, target market, Teenage girls between 13 and 18. What happens to teenage girls between 13 and 18? They break up with their boyfriends. Hmm, let's write a song about it. It's really funny because you know, whenever we talk about our blogs, we say my blog, my podcast, my this, my that, when really though, who is it for? It's for your audience. So understand who exactly your audience is and that's gonna require you perhaps to get a little bit uncomfortable and actually reach out to individuals and talk to them and keep asking why so you can understand exactly what they're going through. 
That's the first thing. Second thing I want to talk about, actually, a lot of you have probably done this already. I want you to imagine having a conversation with somebody that you've just met for the first time, right? Totally brand new, something you're probably going to be doing a lot here this week, this weekend. And the conversations always start out the same, you know, that small talk, right? Like, oh, where are you from? Oh, I'm from San Diego, California. Oh, that's cool. How about you? Or my blog's at Smart Passive Income. That's cool. How about you? But then all of a sudden, in the middle of that conversation, one of you will share something that both of you have experienced before, right? It'll be like, um, hey, what school did you go to? Oh, I went to Cal, UC Berkeley. You went to Cal? I went to Cal. Are you serious? What year did you graduate? Oh, five? Oh, six. Oh, my gosh, awesome best friends forever. Go Bears. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, that's how friendships start, and that's how you can convert your casual audience into active members by sharing these really interesting things about you that people can connect with on an individual level. You have to put a little bit of you in your brand. Put you into your brand. This is why I spend money to have my voiceover guy at the beginning of each of my podcast episodes share a different random fact about who I am. And when I started doing this, people who are experts in the industry were saying things like, Pat, like, this, is, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Like, why would you waste your time and your money doing this? And now those people are coming back to me, six and a half million downloads later of my podcast, saying, Pat, you are genius. <laughs> and my response is, no, I'm just being human. I'm just being a human being online who knows how to connect with people. So share these interesting things about you with your audience. And you don't have to go overboard. You can just share these random things. I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've been to a conference and people have come up to me, and it's the first time I've ever met them, but they say things like, Pat, how'd your fantasy football team do? And I'm like, I don't want to talk about it this year. <laughs> I had somebody last night say, Pat, I'm also half Filipino. And I was like, sweet, Pinoy pride, right? And then, you know, I had a guy, I had a guy come up to me at, uh, at one conference one time, and he came up to me like a little too close, like I was wondering what he was going to do. He was like coming up to my ear, and he's like, Pat, I'm also scared of spiders. <laughs> And then we hugged it out. <laughs> you know, so connecting with people on an individual level like that by sharing these things about yourself are going to go a very, very long way. Now, check this out. <laughs> I mean, it's really easy for me to connect with people who share the same love that I have for something that I'm a raving fan of, Back to the Future. Any Back to the Future fans? <laughs> nice. See, we could all get together and have a party. <laughs> and we have these shared experiences that we could talk about. We don't even know each other, but we already have these shared experiences. I mean, check out this image. This is, I had professional photographers come to my home, to my home office, to film cool pictures around me in my office. And I had this idea of saying, hey guys, let's take a picture of me in front of my Back to the Future memorabilia. How lame is this? <laughs> so lame. And this has nothing to do with my business, right? but it has everything to do with developing a real relationship with my audience. Therefore, it actually has everything to do with my business. Now, next tip, again, we're talking about casual audience members, converting them into active audience members, and I have one final story for you in, in, in regards to that. When I was 20, I was studying architecture at UC Berkeley, and my fall semesters were always super crazy because not only did I have architecture studio, but I had marching band. And like I would literally fall asleep right before halftime shows sometimes. Uh, this was actually in the Vegas Bowl in 2004, actually. Um, and it'd be crazy. But my spring semesters, I love my spring semesters. I had all the time in the world. Only a couple classes, no studio, no marching band. So I did what every 20-year-old male college student would do with all that free time. I played video games. <laughs> nice. I played video games. In my junior year, my buddy introduced me to a game that literally took over my life for three months. Like, I remember staying up for over 48 hours straight with monsters and Red Bulls, bloodshot eyes, but I was having a good time. Not a good look, though. Now, what was this game? This game was called World of Warcraft. I, I heard some Halos there. I played that, too. But World of Warcraft. And... For those of you who don't know this game, it's sort of an RPG game where you can go in and you become a character and you can slay things and you get gold and you, you go on quests. It's like super cool. And you know, I remember the very first five minutes of playing this game because I remember within the first five minutes, I was like, oh, no, this isn't good. I'm going to be here for a while. <laughs> and then I had bloodshot eyes and monsters and all that stuff. 
Now, what happened in the first five minutes? Well, let me tell you. What happens when you first start this game is you know you select your character. You can choose between alliance and horde and that whole thing. You get to customize your character, which is pretty cool, right? But then you get immediately put into this world, a virtual world with other people around the world who are also playing, and you start your first quest. And it's a super easy quest, probably to help you understand the controls and stuff. But what's cool is you like kill a few things and you get experience points, and then you get gold. And all of a sudden, after you kill just a few things, you level up. You go from level one to level two. You uncover new abilities and all this cool stuff. It's super cool. And I was, I was hooked right after that point. And World of Warcraft, like many other addicting video games, was harnessing the power of the quick, small win. Here's another game that you might know. This is Angry Birds. How many of you have ever played Angry Birds? <laughs> right? I don't know if you guys remember what the first level looks like, but this is what it looks like. You have three Angry Birds, right? Three chances. On the right-hand side, one bad piggy. <laughs> On the top of this tower, if you hit any part of it, you're going to win. This is like the worst architecture I've ever seen. <laughs> But this has been the start. This quick, small win has been the start of many people's addictions. So the idea here is to give your audience a way to get a quick, small win, a quick, instant result from what you have to do. That's going to hook them in. Hook, line, and sinker. There's a blog I used to read, sort of on and off. A lot of you might know it. It's IWillTeachYouToBeRich.com by Ramit Sethi. Great blog. And when I first read it, you know, there was, it was cool, and I would read it every, every once in a while. But then there was this one post I read where he shared a script that you can actually read off of when you call your cable company, and you actually save like 30, 20 to 30 bucks a month on your bill by just reading this script for the cable company. And I did it. In five minutes, I was able to save 20 to $30 a month on my cable bill. I was hooked on his stuff from then. Again, five minutes, quick win. Now, another thing I like to do, and something I recommend if you have an email list, is you know when people subscribe to your email list, they get that first follow-up email, right? Make sure you provide a quick win in there, something really cool, maybe even your best quick win tip to get people engaged right away and show them that you have something to give them. Now, there's a book by Charles Duhigg called The Power of Habit, and he talks about the power of small wins. And he talks about how the reason this works is because our brains will associate these quick rewards with whatever is giving us this reward. So what you want to do is you want to establish this pattern right away. I mean, we all want to change the lives of everybody who comes across our site, and we have these big goals for them, but we need to break them up into little tiny goals to get them hooked so we can then help them out in the future and get them toward those big goals. All right, now we're going to move up the pyramid. We're going to go from active audience to connected community. And the cool part about this is, you know, not only are you as a brand speaking to your users or your audience, but they are also speaking back to you. And like I said before, even more important, they're speaking with each other as well. So what you want to do is you, you, you want, I mean, there's actually two th sort of themes within this section here. The first one is you are actually providing an experience beyond the normal experience that casual audience members have on your site. You're providing an additional experience, something that people can have a memory from or a personal moment. And the second thing is you're actually facilitating these discussions between people and actually making it easy for people to talk to each other as well and engage. So the first thing I want to do is actually give you two tips to help you increase the engagement that you have on any of your platforms, your blog, your social media uh, presence, whatever. And these are tips that um, are a little bit different, and, you know, but they work, and I'll show you why. So the first one is ask questions. This isn't actually the tip I want to give you, but this is a tip we've all heard, right? You ask questions, you get answers. A lot of us even don't do this. But I want, to take, I want you to take it a step further. I want you to not just ask questions. I want you to ask for the answer. Ask for the answer. Let me, tell you what, let me tell you exactly what that means and what the difference is. How many of you watch game shows on TV? Hands up. What's your, what's your favorite game show? Shay. Uh, I don't know, Family Feud. Family Feud, <laughs> that's one of my favorites. I love The Price is Right also. You know, all those games are great. And what's interesting about game shows and what, what fascinates me about them is the fact that we can sit through a whole episode and we don't even know who the contestants are, right? Like, we don't even really care about the contestants. But why? How, do we, how are we able to sit through an entire episode of a game show? It's because we like to play along, right? I don't know how many of you do this, but I'll be alone, and I'll be watching uh, you know, Family Feud, and I'll be like, like, Rottweilers! Rottweilers! <laughs> like, nobody's there in the room with me. <laughs> but for some reason, I shout it out. And you know why? It's because we like to confirm that we know the right answer. And this is a strategy I want you to implement in your site. So what does that look like? Well, 
There's this guy named Steve Spangle. He's awesome. And I listened to an episode of social media, uh, the Social Media Marketing Podcast with Michael Stelzner. Great podcast. Highly recommended. And I listened to an episode. Steve Spangler was on it. And he's a scientist, a teacher, a public speaker. And he has a highly engaged community. But it wasn't always highly engaged. At first, you know, what he would do is actually create these really cool YouTube videos sharing an experiment. And then at the end of the video, he would talk about the science behind it, why things happened the way they did. For example, he did one, I think, where he sucked in air from a balloon, and then all of a sudden his voice was like super low. And then he talked about it at the end, well, the gas was sulfur hexafluoride, um, or fluoride hexa, I don't know, I'm not a scientist. But, you know, it was some gas that's much denser than air, so his voice was much lower. And then, you know, he'd get some comments here and there. He'd get comments like, oh, that's awesome. Or, where can I get that gas, right? Like. <laughs> But that's about the extent of it, right? But then he switched it up. Then he only shared the experiment and then asked the audience, how did this happen? Why is my voice lower? How come this balloon did this or whatever? And the engagement went through the roof because everybody likes to share the answers that they know. And what happened was people started debating with each other and like sharing their own best version of the answer, getting in fights in the comment section in his YouTube channel, pulling out their chemistry books, like getting really frustrated with it, which is awesome. When you are the one that can facilitate those types of discussions, cool things will happen. Here's an example from me. I posted this picture on my Facebook page a couple months ago. This is a uh, coconut oil that I get from Costco. I cook with, it's healthier, whatever. And then on the bottom here, it says 100% less cholesterol than butter. And I asked my Facebook followers, why, are they, why do they say 100% less cholesterol than butter when really that's just zero cholesterol? <laughs> and the comments went crazy. People started sharing things like mad, awesome things happened. So what is an answer that you can get from your audience? People love to share an answer when it's formed in, hey, I know what's right. Now, good examples of this is, is you can go on your Facebook page really easily and say, what makes you happy, for example, right? That's a question. But people love to share answers. So I actually did this. I went U plus X equals happy. Solve for X. It's just another way of saying it. But because X is an answer and people want to solve this, comments went through the roof, 30 shares, really cool. People actually started doing standard deviations and all this other actual math to it. <laughs> it's really fun. Now the second tip I want to give you is uh, actually goes back to another YouTube channel. And this YouTube channel is uh, has to, th this strategy involves getting your community to help you make the decisions for your brand. And this is really cool because when you can do this, especially on the regular, people are going to feel like really that they had a part in deciding where you and your brand are going. You know, they're going to really feel connected to the community like they're actually a part of it, which they are. Now there's another YouTube channel that uh, I watch every once in a while and it's a little, you know, there's some language in there so don't show, share this with your kids, but this channel is called Epic Rap Battles of History. And it's Really cool. It pits these like two. It, it actually they ha they hire actors and you know they they write a, a rap script and they have one person versus another and they're usually famous characters from history or TV or television. And what's really cool is at the end of their videos they say, "Who's next? You decide." And then they get millions of comments from people saying, "Do these people versus this people? Do this versus this?" I mean, this one was a video for Gandalf versus Dumbledore, epic rap battle. Uh, there's ones up here, Justin Bieber versus Beethoven, uh, Genghis Khan versus the Easter Bunny, I don't know what that one's about. Um, but it's really cool, and then they actually show snippets or screenshots of people asking, and then they delivered. Now how cool is that? Now, next I want to talk, of, oh, the, the, here's another, here's actually probably my most favorite example of getting a community involved in helping making decisions for your brand. This is uh, Lego Kusu. Uh, Lego is like the only thing my son will sit and do for more than 20 minutes and sit in one spot for. Um, and, and so I've been researching a lot of Lego lately and I've discovered this site. It's so cool because what happens is anybody who has Legos can create their own creation and then post it up here. And if they get enough supporters, Lego will actually manufacture that. They will put the pieces in boxes and ship them out. And this is actually, if I scroll down here, you'll notice number four down here on the bottom says number four DeLorean. I don't know if any of you have seen in Lego stores or lately, I mean, there was a Lego set that came out for Back to the Future. That actually came from the Lego community. It got enough supporters. I mean, that is so cool. So, of course, I went out and bought two. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
you know, I'm going to build one, keep the other one in the box, <laughs> right? Just to make sure, you know, in case the value increases or whatever. <laughs> so next I want to talk about a 19th century strategy that's going to help you increase brand loyalty today. And that is, oh, actually, before I even get to that, I, I don't know if you, a lot of you saw this on Facebook. I actually asked a lot of people, in the, I actually asked my Facebook community to help me decide what the uh, title slide is going to be for this presentation. And I did that on purpose because I needed help, but also because I wanted to share this example with you. So I had people say, hey, would you like A or B? And after one hour, I had 150 comments. Uh, after nine hours, I had 457. And currently, there are 597 people saying A or B. So again, a way to get your community to be involved in decisions. And so doing things like graphics is a good idea. Um, you know, whatever you can think of, be creative. But any way you can get your audience involved in decisions for your brand, it's going to help take your brand loyalty to the next level. And actually, I had a person comment and actually redesign one for me. <laughs> and actually, it looked a lot better. And then she was like, oh, how about this one instead? Like, she just went, like, this is somebody in my community. I didn't pay them to do this. And they just happened to do it because they wanted to help, and they felt like they were involved. So this was a woman named Amanda, and uh, she, uh, Amanda Robbins Johnson, so I want to make sure she gets credit for that. She was the inspiration for the one that actually showed up on the title slide, which you can see in my Facebook page right now. I put a, posted a picture of that. Okay, and also Amy Porterfield did one for a header of her, uh, her newsletter. So she said one, two, three, or four. Which one do you like better? And at the bottom, you can see 928 comments. It's a super crazy way to get people involved. Just A or B, which one? Try it. Okay, now I want to talk about a 19th century strategy that's going to help you get more brand loyalty today. And this strategy is called the factory tour. The factory tour. In the 1800s, American factories started opening up their doors, first for investors so that they knew what was going on behind the scenes and they knew their money was being well spent. But then they op opened it up to the public. And this is something that like families signed up to do. Like that was a fun thing they did on the weekend and it's still fun to do. I don't know if you've ever been on a factory tour, but I've been on tours of breweries. I went on a chocolate factory tour, the Scharfenberger Chocolate Factory in Berkeley. Um, that was with my ex-girlfriend, so don't mention that. And uh, no, it's just really fun. I mean, think about uh, what happens when, wh wh people just love to know things, right? Knowing how things work is the basis for appreciation and is thus a source of civilized delight. What happens when you go to a Krispy Kreme? a standalone Krispy Kreme store. What do you see? You see a glass panel and you get to look inside of the donuts just on this line, trickling along, cooking in the oil, they flip over the frosting. Oh man, it's just awesome. You see kids that are like up on, like, uh, up on the rail like that. Uh, another example, um, you know, even, uh, unwrapped on, on, on the Food Network. You know, that's another one that shows behind the scenes stuff of how things are created, how stuff works on the Discovery Channel, even Apple is catching on. Before, they never included images and pictures of stuff that was going on inside their factories. Now, if you watch their keynotes, they always show that. They show the unibody structure and these like robots and things like showing how things are work, precision, laser cut, all that stuff, because they know. Kickstarter. Kickstarter campaigns love to share the origins of their story and also share drawings and, and CAD drawings and the prototypes. Like That stuff is so cool. And that's stuff that people can connect with. So when you share these things that are inside of your brand, People feel like they have something special that they're not, that other people who are just normal don't get. So they feel special, right? It's sort of like the secret menu at In-N-Out. You feel cool for knowing it, and then you share it, right? That's awesome. So what are some things you can do? Uh, there are, I mean, Smart Passive Income is an example, pretty much a factory with no doors, right? Like, I just share everything, and people love that, obviously. Um, but you don't have to be that completely transparent, but it does help, and people appreciate that. Uh, uh, who was it? Neil Patel on quicksprout.com, he did a post which was essentially an AMA, or an Ask Me Anything, like it's really popular on Reddit. And what happens is people just ask questions, and he responds. And there's like 900 comments of people asking questions. He responds, and he opens up his door just for a brief moment, and people love that. So you might want to think about maybe doing an AMA for your audience. Ask me anything and just you know, commit to spending a half a day there just answering people's questions. People are going to love it. They're going to feel like they're really a part of your brand. Now the next thing I want you to do, again, we're talking about how to get people into the community, right? Getting people to talk to each other. And this is really important. We want to create gigs. And I say gig, essentially a gig is a, an event. But I like the word gig because it's a little smaller. You don't need to put on a huge event, right? But think of a sporting event, right? You get the tickets for it, 
and there's like a date and you get you 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 build buzz for it you get excited you go to the game you meet people who are also fans you become friends with them you come home with this experience that you can remember forever and share now there's two important things when creating gigs the first one is you want a date time and duration again this is important so people so there's a lead up to it people can get excited and then also it ends meaning people can take that experience home with them and talk about it with other people and also the second thing is you want people to interact with each other too you know, think of sporting events, like I said, uh, concerts, you know, that's, you know, when people go on tours, that's, just, that's like gigs, right? And April told me a story of her first concert, when, and that's really when she became, you know, a, a hardcore fan. It was after her first concert. Her brother got her concert tickets. She invited her friend Cindy. The date was coming up in like a month. They're like, oh my gosh, what are we going to wear? I wonder who's gonna, what song is going to be first. I wonder if Nick's going to look at me. Like all this crazy <laughs> stuff. And what actually happened is she met someone who she's never met before, who was standing right next to her, and the way they connected was this other girl, she was screaming, I love you, Nick Carter. He's the blonde one. And then April was like, April was like, you like Nick Carter? I like Nick Carter. Yay, best friends forever, yay, go Bears, right? <laughs> and then every time Nick Carter came on and did a solo, they would like swoon, and they would like hug each other, go, oh my gosh, she's so cute, like, disgusting. <laughs> But you want to create these sort of events that your people can go into. They don't need to be live events either, but here's a number of different ones that you could do. Um, oh, actually, this is a, a picture of April, a selfie of her two months after this concert, right? And she had this connection, all these, all these memories. Um, it's hard to see on the screen here, but let me point it out for you. Um, Nick Carter, Nick Carter, <laughs> Nick Carter, Nick, 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 Nick. <laughs> yeah, this, I mean, it's still on her wall at her house. Not our house, but her old room. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is, again, the concert, the event is that experience where she became a really true raving fan because she, sh she had something that other people didn't, she felt. Now here's something I've been doing lately, these monthly Q&A sessions. I've been doing Google Hangouts. It's really cool. I bring the people together. I use a tool called Chat Wing. To, you, know, you can use any chat room, but I've been noticing that more people are talking to each other in the chat room than they are connecting with me here on one of these Google Hangouts. Google Hangouts. Webinars are great. Those are really easy. You can do them for free to show your audience and get them connected to you and your brand and give them something special that is different from other brands that they can get. Um, here is one I did for Let Go Day, which marked the five-year anniversary of me getting laid off. Had my family come on. They got to know who I was. It was really cool. Um, you can do meetups. Whenever you go to different places, share a meetup or uh, you know, rent out a restaurant or something if you want. And I have people look. Everyone's talking to each other. No one's talking to me. But that's so cool. <laughs> I had a woman came up, come up to me one time. It was at the end of one of these meetups, and I, there were so many people there. I just met her for the first time at the end, and I was like, you know, uh, I'm sorry. I didn't get to talk to you. Uh, and she was like, Pat, um, no offense. I'm not here to see you. <laughs> and she's like, I love your stuff, but I was here to connect with other people. But if I didn't put on this event, she wouldn't have done that. Uh, Chris and I do uh, workshops every once in a while. This is our one-day one business breakthrough, which is really fun. And uh, you know, this is Jeff Rose. He does something called the debt movement. Now, this is like something you could do. You can put on movements or um, these events that span for you know more than just a day, but for you know a span of time where people can get involved and talk about it with each other. He also did something called the Roth IRA movement that did really well too. So this is Jeff Rose from GoodFinancialSense.com. Um, you could do challenges to your audience too. Hey, for the next month, let's focus on this and then share the results and get people involved and get them to comment. Share pictures, for example. If you're in the health industry, that could be really easy to do. And then lastly, a lot of you know the niche site duel where I have people come in and build a website. We all do it together. We talk, we discuss, and we participate. It's totally awesome. Now, the last thing I want to talk about, again, getting people into the community is reaching out and highlighting community members. And this is really cool because, you know, it's hard to reach out to everyone in your community. But when you reach out to one specific person and you highlight them and you share it, other people are going to feel like they're being touched too because the, that person that you're sharing sort of represents the entire audience, right? So there's different things you could do. Uh, I do this thing on Facebook, for example. I share the top 10 Facebook fans of the month, and I do that using a tool called Boo Shaka. It's a Facebook app, and it just automatically calculates the top 10 fans. You can have it share the top 10 fans who liked, who comment, or overall. And so I share that, and it's really cool. People feel appreciated. Even if those people aren't on this list, People are like, oh, Pat's cool because he recognizes his audience and it gets people to want to engage more so they could possibly become on this list. Here's a tweet from Jeremy Franson from Internet Business Master. He says, thanks at Label3060 Promo and at John Stunzak. 
for being top new followers in my community. And that's a tool he uses to calculate that, uh, commune.it, commune.it. You can see that at the very end. And that's another tool that would share you know, your cool latest new Twitter followers. Now the last thing we're going to talk about is getting people from the connected community to raving fans. How do we do that? Now luckily, if you build your brand the way we talked about and we you know, implement a lot of things we do, there are certain people in your community who will just automatically become raving fans already. It just happens naturally. For some people it happens you know, right away, if you, especially if you give them a unique experience and you touch them in some way or help them in some way. For other people, it might take more time, more experiences, more moments connected to you and your brand. And there's going to be some people in your audience, in your community, who will never become raving fans. And that's okay. You have to realize that not everybody is going to become a raving fan. But there are certain things you can do beyond everything we've talked about to you know, better convert people to raving fan status like we talked about. And a lot of times it happens on an individual basis. But really what it comes down to is creating memorable moments by surprise. When you can surprise someone, do something different for them, that's what gets remembered. That's what helps increase brand loyalty. And the example I like to use is in a relationship, right? You might be in a relationship and your spouse and you, you say I love you before you go to bed every night. You know, I love you, honey, good night. I love you, honey, good night. I love you, honey, good night. And then one night they don't say it back. You're like, are you mad at me? <laughs> Maybe that's just me. <laughs> no, but really you see how it becomes like an expected thing. But it's when you say I love you on a random Tuesday at 3.48 p.m. for no apparent reason. Maybe you drop by the office and surprise them. That is the cool thing that gets remembered. That's what helps takes that relationship to the next level. So how can you surprise your audience? What's cool is like brands and companies who do this right are often described as brands and companies that are like performing magic for their audience, right? And I love that analogy, performing magic, because you know, as a magician, you can you sort of control the user experience. You can provide these amazing things, these surprising moments that get remembered and discovered. So, you know, thank you. We're here in Vegas, and uh, you know, I know a lot of us are going to be busy, so we're not going to have time to go to any shows or anything. Um, but I thought it'd be cool if maybe, um, you know, maybe I did some magic for you guys. Would, would you guys like to see some magic? Okay. And I'm not just doing this because I think magic's cool and because I've never done this before, and I like to try new things. Um, but it actually you know, plays a role in everything we've been talking about. So I'm going to do a few tricks for you. Um, the first trick is actually one where I'm going to find somebody here in the front row. Uh, what's your name? Johnny. Johnny. Here's Johnny. Johnny, can I do a trick for you? Sure. Okay. So I'm going to pull out a deck of cards, and uh, you know, I'm just going just gonna to shuffle them really quick. And I'm going to fan them out for you. Would you please pick one card? Pull it out. Pull it out, yeah. Pull it out. Look at it. You can show the people around you. It's cool. And now, can you, can you look at me in my eyes really quick? <laughs> it's a red card. Um, three of diamonds. Is that right? So three of diamonds, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Now, you see, like, that's a cool experience for John, but, like, for everybody else, I mean, thank you for clapping, but I didn't really affect you in that way, right? So, like, imagine this is, like, you know, really connecting with someone on a personal level, like, via email, for example, or one-on-one. -on -one. It's hard to scale, right? I have to go to every single person and do this trick to everybody, which would take forever. We'd miss sessions. We'd all be angry. But, see, it was a cool experience for you, but it wasn't a cool, a cool experience for everybody else. So that's doing it on an individual level. Now let's take it to the grand scale. Let's, let's get everybody involved here. So I'm going to actually do a card trick for you on the screen here. I'm going to show you five cards. Five cards. I want you to pick one. I want you to pick one of these cards, the one that sort of means the most to you, and focus on that. Think about that card. Okay, now I'm going to turn these cards over, and I'm going to put them aside, and then I'm going to put them back out. And what happens is I'm going to flip down your card. <laughs> if I, if it was... If I flip down your card, raise your hand. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, 
How did that work? Well, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to reveal this to you. I know that's something magicians shouldn't do. I actually worked with a coach for this, a magician, and he was like, yeah, you could totally share it. We don't use this trick. <laughs> so I'm going to share what happened. The reason this is your card is that, let me go back a few. You'll notice that we have clubs and diamonds here, right? When I go on to the next one, they're all different. Yes. So you automatically assume that that one is yours there in the middle. Right. <laughs> so this is a cool trick you can do with like your kids and stuff. But why does this, oh. why does this matter? <laughs> but you see what happened here? I showed you five cards and you just picked one. The one that meant most to you. And so the idea here is that you are going to have these personal experiences with brands that are meaningful to you. And that is something that's really important because that's something that you can really take to the next level and help increase your brand and your loyalty. Now, I have one more trick for you that I want to do before we go, the final trick here of the day. And uh, to do this, actually, John, can you help me out one more time? All right, I'm going to give you this deck of cards. We're going to pick one more card. Can you just hold on tight so no one gets that? We're going to do one more trick here, and we're going to get everybody involved. So the first one was doing an individual. The second one was getting everybody to do something. But still, you had your individual preference for what card that was. Now we're going to get everybody involved. And to do this, um, I'm going to get the help from this giant beach ball here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw this into the crowd. And when I tell you to stop, I want you to catch it. Whoever catches it after I say stop, you're going to select, you're going to help select the card. And we're going to do this bit by bit. So I'm going to toss this out in the crowd. Hopefully I don't hit any cameras or anything, so watch out. You know, bat it around for a few seconds, and then I'm going to say stop. Here we go. <laughs> All right, stop, stop. Somebody catch it. Oh. <laughs> All right, here we go. Stephanie, hey, good to see you, Stephanie. Stephanie, you have the power now. I want you, in a deck of cards, there are two colors, right? There's red and black. Stephanie, can you pick red or black? Red. red. So we have a red card, everybody. OK. Now, Stephanie, what I want you to do is I want you to toss the ball back into the crowd, and we're going to have somebody else select another part of the card. OK? So here we go. Yeah, let's get the back of the room involved. OK, stop. Wow, I can't see your face. What's your name? Troy. Troy. Troy, is that right? Troy, awesome. Thank you so much, Troy. Um, now, we have the red cards selected. Now, there are two types of red cards. There's the heart or the diamond. Now, before you say anything, I want to share something interesting with you. A lot of you know I have a four-year-old son, and uh, you know he's, he's pretty crazy, right? Um, but, you know, I, where'd it go? And, and he's like, he gets into the cupboard sometimes. He has these like phases. And right now his phase is getting into the cupboard and ripping the labels off of our canned food. <laughs> Which is like ridiculous, right? But that's what, he, that's what he's into now. So, you know, we're going to be using this in a second. So let me put this aside. But Troy, can you give me heart or diamond? Which one? Heart. Heart, okay. Wow, that's going to make it harder for me. Okay, heart, awesome. Now, can you toss the ball one more time? We're going to have somebody... Pick the number. One more time. Let's go. Whoa. Watch the chandelier. <laughs> All right, stop. All right, what's your name? Austin. Austin. Awesome. Now, you're gonna, you have the toughest job because you get to pick the value of the card. You know, there's 13 different cards from ace all the way up to king. Now, before you mention anything, John, let me, can, you borrow, can I get borrow the cards really quick? Hold on to that thought. Austin. Now, I have a deck of cards here, and you'll notice, John, and you're going to be the voice of the audience here since not everyone can see. Right. But on the back of all these cards is a different canned food item. We have tuna, pears. This is how we play games and try to figure out what to eat for dinner. Refried beans, <laughs> asparagus, corn, baked beans, cherries, chicken soup, condensed milk, and things like that, right? Now, John, would you confirm that there's, they're all mixed up cards here in the back? Yep. All totally mixed up cards. Okay, so I need the card from... Austin there. We have a red card. We have a heart. What is that card going to be? Jack. Jack of hearts. Jack of hearts. Okay. So I'm going to go back through these, and I want you to find the jack of hearts, John. And when you find the jack of hearts, pull it out. We have the ace of hearts, jack of spades. That would have been tuna. <laughs> jack of hearts. There you go. Now, before you flip that over, John, I'm going to open this can here. And, John, I want you to shout out 
what is on the back of that card. Again, remember, you guys chose this at random, right? Three different people, heart, <laughs> jack of hearts. Can you tell everyone what's on the back of that card? Pineapple. <laughs> Pineapple. <laughs> So the point of this is, I mean, not just this cool magic, right? But like, <laughs> everybody got involved. And even though you weren't necessarily touched, everyone had the opportunity to be involved. And how cool is that? And plus, you know, we're just having fun. You know, this was kind of crazy that I did this, but I did it because I wanted to show you that you have to take risks. You have to take chances in your brand, especially when it comes to getting your audience involved, because it really can take your brand to the next level. So first of all, let's hear for John for the help. Thank you, John. Now, John, I, this couldn't have happened without you. So uh, as a gift, I want to give you this open can of pineapples here. <laughs> All right, now to leave, to, to, to leave you guys, I want to give you one piece of advice. It's, it's, it's that thing that you seem to pull out of thin air for your audience that is really going to help you get to that next level. So I want you all to look at my hand. Ooh. And now I have one final surprise for you. If you are sitting in a chair, and I'm sorry I don't have as many chairs, but if you're sitting in your chair, I want you to reach down I have a little surprise for you underneath your chairs. You can reach down in the front of you. There's, so it's a little appreciation for you coming to my uh, presentation. For those of you who are sitting, it's a card that says, I appreciate you guys for coming and watching the presentation. I can give you one here at the end. Now, again, we chose Jack of Hearts, right? So if you have a Jack of Hearts, I would love for you to come up after this presentation. And uh, I have a 124 scale DeLorean for you. Oh. And uh, you know, guys, uh, 124 scale DeLorean for Back to the Future. Uh, come, come talk to me after. Thank you guys so much for attending. I appreciate you so much. <laughs> <laughs>